The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everybody and welcome to the standardization webinar for animal management. My name is Alison Atkinson and I'm the principal moderator for technical qualifications. In room and leading the session today is John Kerrigan, who's the principal moderator for level three animal management. Um, I'm not going to start the webinar straight away because I can see from the attendance list that there's a few more people that are waiting for. So I'm just going to put myself on mute and just wait for a couple more people to arrive, if that's okay. Okay, there's a few more people that's, uh, that are in attendance now, so um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Again, my name's Alison Atkinson, and um, welcome to the standardisation webinar for animal management. The intention for this webinar is to have everybody in listen-only mode, whilst John goes through the slides, and at the end of the session, you'll be given the opportunity to type in some questions using the questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen. If you do experience any technical difficulties, please be assured that we are recording this session and you'll be able to access that in a day or two. John will point you towards the support available to you in a later slide, but if you have any burning questions you'd like answered immediately, the Technicals Moderation Support Team will be happy to help you. Their number is 01924 206 719. Okay, John, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Alison said, my name is John Kerrigan, and I'm the Principal Moderator for all Level 3 Animal Management Technical Qualifications. As an extension of the Generic Centre Standardisation webinar, uh, City Guilds have produced subject-specific ones where we carry out standardisation on some learner work from last year's synoptic assignment using this year's assessment objectives and paperwork. Um, you were sent this work along with the associated paperwork and asked to carry out a marking activity, so hopefully you've had a uh, chance to do this, so we can start to go through the thoughts and justifications of the marking um, by the principal moderator. So to clarify, all participants are currently in listen-only mode whilst we take you through the series of slides. There will be an opportunity to have your questions answered at the end, so please take a note of these as we go through. Um, at any time, you can type your question into the questions box on the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. But if you want to concentrate on the slides, you will be given some time at the end to type in your questions, and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. The objectives of the session are to explain the justification of marks by the principal moderator for last year's synoptic assignment and highlight good practice in the use of the City and Guilds documents. Um, to facilitate a standardisation activity and to remind you of typical activities recommended for internal standardisation. So, um, first off, we will, if we remind ourselves of what the candidate was asked to do, um, so I'd just like to confirm we are looking at last year's synoptic assignment. Um, and so you don't get confused, we are using this year's documents. So a quick overview of the assignment brief um, and then each page of the evidence. So if we 
if you have your assignment brief there. If you don't, there is a um, yeah on, on the, the handouts in the um, on the right hand side in the pane. It's got handouts two of five. So if you click on that, you'll be able to see that you've got both the presentation slides and also the standardisation material. Okay, so um, the assignment brief's there. I'm not going to, to read through the whole assignment brief, um, but it's basically asking for uh, plans and giving the assignment brief, if you like, paints a, a window, um, a picture really for the candidate to be able to put into context what we're actually asking for within the assignment tasks. Okay, so then um, going through the tasks, um, the bit that we're interested in is where it says what you must produce for marking. So for task one, we can see that they must produce a completed animal feeding plan, an animal health plan, and a short report. Um, in task two, they must produce a written report, including research notes and references. Uh, task three is a completed husbandry task. And then optionals, we've got uh, use of photographs or videos that will enhance the evidence. Uh, so we're only interested in videos and photographs if they actually enhance the evidence that the um, assessor and candidate have submitted. And then task four is a completed health check sheet along with um, obviously the practical observation forms. And this little bit here with the conditions and assessment, I think it's quite interesting, John. Yeah, so on task four, it says where a large animal is used for task three, a small animal must be used for task four, or vice versa. Um, if a large animal was used for task three, then a small animal should be used for task four. So again, it's really important for centres to pick up on these little conditions of assessment that there might be. Um, for example, there it's saying a centre health check sheet or one produced by the candidate may be used. So again, um, as a centre, if you wish to produce a health check sheet to help learners, then that's entirely up to you. Or you can allow the learner to produce their own, in which case it gives them a bit more of um, freedom, really, to, to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding. Okay. I'm going to work through them all. Um, yes, yeah, so um, you hopefully will all be familiar with the marking grid for this year, um, and that way we won't need to go through it. Um, we can see there that the learner has submitted a feeding plan, um, so they've given us the, the type of animal and some animal details there, um, and then gone straight into a feed plan regarding um, uh, on a weekly basis, what they're going to feed the animal in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, they then move on to um, a small amount of explanation around their feeding plan, uh, and then they give us the health plan. So, um, in a basic format, they've listed there what sort of things go into a health plan, and then again, there's some justification from the candidate as to what their health plan entails. Uh, they've then moved on to a feeding plan for a pregnant animal. Um, again, they've given the details of the animal and then they've uh, broken it down into different weeks as to um, the differences within that feed plan based on the animal's pregnancy. And then again, there's some annotation um, after the animal, uh, after the feed plan, sorry, based on what the animal needs and from the learner's point of view, justifying what their plan entails. Over the page again, we've got uh, the health plan for a pregnant animal. And again, there's a list there of what the learner thinks should be in the health plan. And then there's some annotation as to why they think those components are essential. The um, short report is that it's a very short report on the Animal Welfare Act 2006 and the five animal needs. So the learner there has listed what the five animal needs are and then uh, giving some penalties as to uh, the issues if you do not abide by the legislation. Uh, and then they've given some references. So they've used books, they've used online journals, and they've used websites. Um, so there's quite a few pages of references. 
They've then gone on for task two, which is the evolution and domestication of animals. Um, they've talked about evolution there, and then uh, the report follows on with domestication. The report then follows on how to manage a female horse from conception to birth and reproductive technologies, and then they offer a small conclusion as well. Um, so we can see there so far that the candidates covered all the elements of task one that have been asked for and all the elements of task two. Again, offering books, online journals and websites for referencing. Now, um, this work does have in practical observation forms um, for task three and task four. Now, normally these would not be submitted. So this centre decided to submit the practical observation forms. Um, but realistically, there's quite a lot of gaps throughout the forms. So they're not giving much to the moderator, really, uh, in terms of value for evidence. I just want to question you a little bit on that, um, because this is called a practical observation form, presumably coming from a centre devised form, is it? Uh, this, no, this was a, a City and Guilds form okay. last year for okay. the centres to use. Right. It was also called a practical observation form, so it was a bit confusing. Yeah. Um, however, this year, those forms are not in it. Okay, so, so there is only the practical observation the, form that will be used. Okay, right. We'll look at that later on, won't we? Right. Yes, we'll Thank you. That in a minute. So then there's the two practical observation forms. And then over the page, we see that the student has offered a uh, an outline of a ferret and has annotated the uh, diagram to explain about the ferret health check. So this would be the health check form that they've submitted. So again, we can see that the learner has covered all sections of the tasks that have been asked for. Um, so then we can look at, from the centre really, what, what's gone on. So first of all, we want to look at the declaration of authenticity. We can see that the candidate's name is up there along with the centre. The candidate uh, centre number and the, uh, sorry, the candidate number and the centre number, centre number will be there as well. And the candidate signature and the date are there, as well as the tutor's signature and date. So the form this year has slightly changed. You'll see there to say, has the candidate received any additional support in the production of this work? Um, obviously, in this instance, the answer is no. Um, if you're to tick yes, then you need to give details of the kind of support that they have had. So if the candidate, for example, has had extra time, um, or anything like that, then you need to be giving it in there, or if the candidate has had a scribe, then you need to be um, providing that evidence there. Okay. The next page is the practical observation form. So this is the sitting Guild's practical observation form, and this is the only form, really, that we need for the practical evidence. So again, we can see that there's a candidate name at the top, the candidate number is there, and the centre number, um, and the assessment ID. And then um, it goes into each assessment objective for how the centre feels the candidate has um, done during their practical elements of the synoptic assignment. So bearing in mind that for this uh, sample, the candidate had to do two different uh, practical tasks. So this practical observation form is summarising both of those tasks. So for AO1, they've got strong, consistent recall with a confident and fluid approach, such as animal requirements, housing requirements, diet, etc. Some slight inaccuracies, but later identified these and corrected. Detailed knowledge of PPE requirements, of handling and restraint techniques. Knowledge of species-specific requirements were good, including temperature ranges of the animal. There were some slight inaccuracies regarding species-specific abnormal behaviour, and there was some use of incorrect terminology. So that's all the evidence we've been given for AO1. AO2 is saying to us that some explanations offered regarding the housing and husbandry, but unable to expand on those to demonstrate a full understanding. The nutrition identified and some explanation as to why the animal requires it and linking to the lifestyle. There was understanding of behaviour demonstrated that related to the husbandry. There was some understanding was limited regarding the health check, e.g. they could have given a sign of illness 
rather than just stating what the signs were. Okay, so rather, I think there, rather than um, in the health check stating the animal's eyes were clear and there was no discharge, they could have given a sign of illness saying that if there was a discharge and it was yellow, that could be an indication that the animal has conjunctivitis, for example. Um, good handling and restraint techniques demonstrated, confident with one of the animals, slightly hesitant with the other. So we know that this candidate is more confident with uh, one of the animals rather than the other, so therefore may have done a better practical with one of the animals rather than the other. Uh, the candidate was able to maintain restraint despite the animal trying to escape and the candidate was dexterous in their approach in that they were not hesitating with any part of the husbandry routine or setting up the accommodation. So this is a fairly com confident and competent candidate. Completed tasks within acceptable time frame to meet industry requirements and to meet industry standards. AO4 then is the candidate was able to consolidate some theory to practice when discussing the nutrition of the animal and the animal's behaviour. There were some missed opportunities to demonstrate knowledge and application with regard to legislation and the needs of the animal. There was a lack of explanation at times meant consolidation of theory could not be proven. So again, this is where the candidate has the opportunity during the practical to bring in some of that theory and prove how they link that theory to their practical. And this candidate obviously hasn't always uh, taken up on that opportunity. AO5 then, certain sections of husbandry were perfected in that the candidate was ensuring all parts of the animal housing were thoroughly cleaned before replacing. Areas that detail was lacking where the water bowl was left out at the end of the setup and the safety door at one point was left open, meaning the animal could have escaped. All sections of the assessment were covered. So from the practical observation form, we then use the information that's on there, as well as the information we've seen from the uh, written evidence to move on to the candidate record form. So we're just going to jump to the slides um, just so that we can go from one to the other as we break it down. Bear with us a second. Okay, so if we look at uh, AO1, recall of knowledge, um, so we can see the band one descriptor is recall is showing some weakness. Band two is moving on to recall being genuinely accurate. So um, there may be some inaccuracy, but generally talking it's accurate um, and there's some minimal gaps in there and then band three is that the um, evidence that the learners provided for recall is strong it's accurate and they're confident that it's and there's recall from the full breadth of the, of the qualification so for this uh, piece of work the candidate has been awarded um, four marks so that puts them at the top of band one. Um, so for the top of band one, we're saying that the candidate shows a range of knowledge from across the qualification with some inaccuracies in some key areas. So the um, candidate record form is stating that candidate's recall is basic and covers some breadth from the qualification. The feeding plan has large portions of information missing. The candidate's answers are basic and lack depth, such as the nutrients should be increased. But the candidate there hasn't gone on to tell us how the, can, uh, how the nutrients should be increased or what nutrients should be increased. They've simply stated nutrients should be increased. Health plan is the basic and lacks depth of disease or signs of ill health. There's no linking of nutrition to disease. The report on the theory of evolution is just copied and pasted. For the majority demonstrating a complete lack and depth of knowledge. So this candidate has literally, they've had their research materials and they've literally either typed it out again word for word or if they've had the research materials electronically they've just copied and pasted it across. Uh, there's incorrect statements regarding evolution and evolution timelines. The domestication of the horse is brief and lacks detail to demonstrate any knowledge really of what the domestication is. 
There's no breed domestication discussed whatsoever. Um, they've merely discussed the domestication of a horse. There's a basic recall of the needs of the pregnant mare, but again, these lack depth. Uh, there's limited breeding strategies discussed, but they're simply stated. And there's knowledge of husbandry requirements and feeding requirements demonstrated during the practical. So this is why they are at the uh, bot uh, top of band one rather than moving into a band two. So if we then move on to uh, AO2, which is understanding of concepts, theories and processes relating to the learning outcomes. Uh, so the lower band is some evidence of being able to give explanations and concepts and theories. Explanations appear to be recalled, simplistic or incomplete. Misunderstandings are, are there. It's illogical, um, illogical connections, so the, the connections just aren't there. And basically the candidate is guessing some of the work. Uh, band two is explanations are logical, showing comprehension and generally free from misunderstanding, but they may lack depth or connections are incompletely explored. The work is logical, but it may be slightly disjointed, but it is plausible. And then band three is consistently strong evidence of clear causal links and explanations generated by the candidate. Candidate uses concepts and theories confidently in explaining decisions taken and applications to new situations. There's logical reasoning thoughtful decisions, causal links, and then the main one here at the top of this band is that the, the candidate has justified um, what the, their understanding is. So for AO2, um, I awarded the candidate um, three, so that puts them in the middle of band one. Uh, the reasons for that is the explanations are mainly recalled and are simplistic. The feeding plan merely states the amounts and food types, so there's no explanation of, of why, um, just that the amount should be increased and that the, they would give this type of food. Uh, the healthcare plan does not go into detail regarding the types of illness or disease. There's no explanation there about how they're prevented or treated, simply that they need to be worked to prevent worms. Um, so again, not showing any understanding really of the topic. There was no understanding of the relevance of the Animal Welfare Act 2006 or how the needs affected the welfare of the animal. So they, they simply recalled the needs and, and just copied that from the RSPCA. Evolution theories are copied and pasted with no further explanation to prove any understanding. The candidate offers no explanations of how the horse was domesticated, simply that it was. Um, so again, you know, as if by magic it was domesticated. Uh, there was some explanation as to why it was domesticated, um, but again, they haven't really gone into detail. There's little under understanding demonstrated of the care required for a pregnant mare or the reproductive technologies that could be utilised. Um, so again, this candidate was simply listing the different reproductive technologies and not really given any understanding as to why those reproductive technologies are used. Moving on to AO3 then for application of uh, practical or technical skills. There's uh, band one is some evidence of familiarity with practical skills, some awkwardness in implementation. It may show frustration out of inability rather than a lack of care. So it's not that they don't want to do a good job, it's just that they're not able to. Uh, they're unable to adapt, they may get frustrated. There may be flaws in their practices, um, they could be out of tolerance and imperfect, and they may come across as clumsy. Band two is that they're generally successful application of skills, although areas of complexity may present a challenge. The skills are not yet second nature, so this candidate is still having to think quite carefully about what they're doing. They're somewhat successful, however, there is some inconsistencies. And they're fairly adept and capable, so uh, this candidate can be left to get on with things. So, uh, band three then is consistently high levels of skill and or dexterity, showing ability to successfully make adjustments to practice. So, this candidate is able to change the way they do things to uh, fit the situation that they're working in. They're able to deal successfully with complexity. 
So it's not just that they're dealing with one thing at a time, they're able to think about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. They're dexterous, they're fluid, it comes naturally to them, they're skilled and they're practiced. Uh, so for this uh, candidate, I awarded uh, nine, so that puts them at the top of band two. So the top of band two shows attention to detail and engagement, which is what was stated in the practical observation form. Uh, they complete tasks within agreed time scales. Again, that's in the practical observation form. They're compliant with health, safety, and hygiene requirements. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, overall they're compliant. There may have been some instances, for example, when they left the door open. Um, there's confident application of skills and work produced to a good standard, appropriate care of equipment, consistent consideration for the animal's needs. So although they left the bowl out, what for me, what this um, practical observation form doesn't state is whether the candidate identified that the bowl had been left out or whether the assessor had to do that. Because it's very different for, <coughs> excuse me, um, for that candidate that realises at the end they've left the water dish out and then rectifies the issue, to me is of a much higher level than the candidate who thinks they finished. <coughs> excuse me. Is um, sorry, I do apologise. Um, the candidate is thinks they're finished. Is quite happy to walk off and leave the situation, and only then does the assessor say, "Well, actually, there's a bowl being left out." So those two candidates are on a very different level. Um, so. There's consistent consideration for the animal needs and demonstrates awareness of industry standards. So the assessor had already uh, written that they were performing within industry time and to industry standards. So this candidate was knowledgeable with the species requirements and the handling techniques for both species. There was some hesitation with one species when it came to handling. But they were very confident with the other species in that restraint was maintained despite the animal wanting to escape. There's explanations of terms given, but there was some incorrect use of terminology, so we're not saying the candidate perfect. The candidate was lax at times that accommodation doors were left open and the water bowl was not replaced after cleaning. The candidate was confident with familiar sections, but hesitant with the unfamiliar sections. Okay. So moving on to AO4, bringing it all together, coherence of the whole subject. So band one is some evidence of consideration of theory when attempting tasks, tends to attend to single aspects at a time without considering implications of contextual information. So does this learner just look at one aspect at a time or can they deal with several aspects and consider several things? There's some random trial and error, new situations are challenging and they expect guidance. They, uh, they could be narrow-minded, so they can only focus on one element, and they may need prompting. A band two candidate shows good application of theory to practice in a new context, with some inconsistencies. They remember to apply theory, somewhat successful at achieving fitness for purpose, and there's some consolidation of theory and practice. The band three candidate then has strong evidence of thorough consideration of the context and the use of theory and skills to achieve fitness for purpose. They do purposeful experimentation, they come up with plausible ideas, and they are guided by theory and experience. They have, they, what they do is fit for purpose, um, they integrate it, and they use their whole toolkit of theory and skills. So these candidates are literally bringing in their knowledge, understanding from every aspect of the qualification to carry out whatever they need to do. So for this candidate, I awarded six marks, okay, which puts them um, towards the lower part of band two. So that would be the candidate consistently brings together their knowledge, understanding and skills with basic analysis, problem solving and reflection on animal management. The candidate makes key links between a range of topics across the qualification and uses these links to inform practical activities. So there was some good application of theory to practical demonstrated during the practical assessments, 
such as relation of nutrition to life stage and to species, and how the enclosure design and enrichment can affect the animal's behaviour. The candidate was completing less application of theory during the written assignment, as there were no links between health and other aspects. There was some minimal discussion around the link of nutrition with the animal's health, but again, these links were very superficial. The candidate was fully compliant with health and safety at all times, with sound linking of PPE to the task at hand. So as far as bringing it all together, this candidate was much better and much more successful at doing that within the practical element of the um, assignment rather than the theory element. So the last AO then is AO5, attention to detail and perfecting. So band one is easily distracted, there's a lack of checking, there's insufficient concern by a poor result. Uh, there's little attempt to improve, they give up too early, the focus may be on completion rather than quality. So these are the learners that are just trying to get it done as quick as they can so that they've got it finished rather than making sure they're doing a good job with it. They may be careless, imprecise, they will be flawed, they may not care or appear like they don't care, they're unfocused, they don't really observe what the, what's going on so they're unobservant and they're unmotivated. Band two is the aim for a satisfactory result, but may not persist beyond this. They use feedback methods, but perhaps not fully or consistently. And there's variable or intermittent attention. So reasonably conscientious, but there are some imperfections. And these candidates are unremarkable, which is quite a strong term. Um, the top of the band then is that the candidate is alert. They're focused on their task. They're attentive and persistently pursuing excellence. They use feedback to identify problems for correction. They notice things, they're checking things, they're persistent, so they'll keep going until they get it done and get it done right. Uh, they're perfecting. They're always refining their own practice. Uh, they're accurate. They focus on quality. So for them, it's more about getting the job done perfectly rather than getting it done quickly. Uh, they use precision and refinement. They're faultless and they are meticulous within their tasks. So I awarded this candidate um, the top of band two. So there is consistent attention to detail across all tasks. Evidence provided is accurate and related to specific tasks. The quality of work meets industry standards. So we're hearing terms there that we have seen within um, the evidence from the assessor. So for this, the candidate was fully engaged with the practical tasks but their attention to detail was occasionally lacking and that the left doors open and forgot to replace equipment. At one point, the candidate also utilised the incorrect disposal bin and this had to be changed after. Now here they haven't said again whether the assessor identified that or whether the candidate identified that. The candidates covered all aspects of the assignment in some detail with minimal mistakes. The candidate was able to work independently with regard to the stock assessment and practically produce work to industry standard. Written work is lesser to standard, and they needed to go into more detail to be at industry level. So overall, um, the marking I gave this um, assignment was 26. So uh, last year, 25 was the pass mark. So this is a very low pass. This candidate has just passed by the skin of their teeth. Um, so which to me is, is, is evident from the assignment, really. Okay, thanks for that, John. That's really um, been really helpful. I think um, just as a sort of just to clarify, I know that um, looking back at the marking grid, if we can just have a quick look at one of them, one of the questions that often comes up is um, these bands were put in um, not as kind of uh, references to past merit and distinction. But just as a way of kind of, um, of differentiating between performances and, and between kind of quality of, um, of, of things that uh, when you're looking at the evidence. So I think that's an important point to make. Um, we're just going to go on now and um, give you an opportunity to ask your questions. As I said, there is that um, that pain in the on the side there that that gives you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, we're just going to have a look at some of those, but we're going to put ourselves on pause whilst we do that. So if you don't mind, we're just going to have a, have a quick look at that. I can see somebody's hand is raised, so I will just check that they can, uh, that they're okay. 
you want to ask a, a question, Jane, you've got your, uh, sorry, Sarah Jane, you've got your uh, your hand up there, so just um, pop your question into the into the questions pane, um, and we'll go on mute just for about three or four minutes whilst we uh, have a look at some of these questions. Thanks very much. Hello, welcome back everybody. We've just had a quick look through some of the, uh, the questions and obviously we're not going to have time to look at all of them to be able to answer them sufficiently. So what we're going to do is create a, a document with all of the questions and then all of the answers. So um, you're safe in the knowledge that everyone will get an answer to it, but perhaps not during this webinar. So we will um, get hold of you later and give you that, uh, that opportunity to read through them. But we have got some um, here that we can ask John. Um, so we have got one question here. Can an assessor of a practical mark the overall synoptic of the same student? Uh, the answer to this is absolutely. <laughs> so basically um, any assessor can mark all of the synoptic assessment. Uh, it doesn't have to be that practical assessors mark the practical bit and the theory people mark the theory bit. Um, as far as we're concerned, it is a synoptic assessment, so it should be some mark, It should be marked in the same way. Um, we've had another similar question mm. we, that yes. was about um, basically breaking it up. That should it be uh, multiple members of staff marking and uh, things like that. So just be very, very careful that you don't fragment the assignment too much because the learners have approached this in a synoptic manner. It is being assessed in a synoptic manner. 
So if you then fragment it down for marking, you then have to pull it all back together again to come up with a synoptic mark and based on the assessment objectives that we've been through. So you're sort of creating more work for yourself if you then start to break it down to have to pull it back together again. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is each task should not be marked um, distinctly from each other. You're looking at all of the evidence together and with some, one of the task one, for example, might be, mar might be marked down because the candidate struggled with that particular task, but task two might be a practical task and, and the candidate might have, have actually done really well there, so they will raise their marks there. Absolutely. And so it kind of goes up and down and up and down and then finally you get to a, to a mark. There was a question as well where it said that can multiple people in a room decide on a mark? And what yeah, would you say again, that? absolutely. From a standardisation point of view, it's really good before you even start to think about marking the assignments to sit down as a group and decide, well, what do we actually want to see? What do we expect to see from the tasks? What do we expect to see students producing and to what standard? So then once you've done that, the easiest way then is that somebody would mark a piece of learner, a, a learner's work. So um, like we've done here, we've looked at one, one candidate's work, somebody has marked it and then given it um, a grade against each assessment objective and then what you would do is you would then pull all your other markers in line with that person because as long as the centre has standardised then it's not an issue. The issue is when we have one marker that would give them um, maybe four, so the top of band one for A01, but then the next marker would maybe give them a nine, so the bottom of band three for A01, and that's where the issues lie. So we need to make sure that there's a standardised approach from the centre. Excellent, thanks John. Um, next question is, can you give rough guidelines what a pass, merit and distinction is? Um, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, basically because the um, pass, merit and distinction marks uh, don't get decided until the work has been marked and moderated. Um, so marks can be adjusted down or adjusted up. Um, so no, there's no way of saying it's past merit or distinction. The other thing that we could flag up actually, if you wanted to have a kind of a ballpark figure for some of these um, some of these past merit distinction grade boundaries, is to have a look at last year's qualification report, because all of that data is within that uh, that report. It's on the website, um, there's a link to it from these slides that we'll show you later on at the end of this presentation, but that's always a good way to start. And obviously, just bear in mind that those grade boundaries do fluctuate with different assessments. Some are deemed more difficult than others in, in subsequent years, and just like GCSEs and A-levels, those grade boundaries move up and down as well. But it can give you some sort of an idea about where those um, boundaries lie. Next question, is the detail only uploaded for the selected sample students and just grades for the rest, or just marks for the rest, um, or what happens on the moderation portal? Okay, so for the uh, moderation portal, the centre will upload um, their sample. So depending on how many learners you have, that could be anywhere from 12 up to 20. Um, so you would upload all of the work for those learners in the sample, and the sample must include your highest distinction and your lowest, uh, or your highest grade and your lowest grade, should I say, rather than distinction and pass. Um, and then um, the, all the other candidates, it's simply their mark that is uploaded, not the actual work. Thank you. Next question, do we need to annotate learners' written work? Okay, um, so there's been a couple of questions about this one. When you're annotating the work, you're no longer annotating the work for the learner. You're annotating the work for the moderator. Um, so if you want to annotate the work to show the moderator where you're finding the evidence to mark them against the assessment objectives, then that's entirely up to you. But there's certainly there's no need to um, mark as if you're expecting the learner to use your feedback to improve because the learner will not be getting that piece of work back. So even if they failed the synoptic um, assignment, they would not get the same synoptic assignment. They would have to do the following year's synoptic assignment. Okay. 
Next question. I think I might be able to answer this, John. <laughs> Do all centres have to submit the employer engagement planner or just those that are running the technicals for the first time? Which is an interesting question, actually. And um, as part of your approval process, you do need to um, submit the planner that hasn't yet been um, uh, populated with all your activities, but you've planned these activities. The answer to the question is that every year you would submit a planner that has been populated towards the end of the programme, that has all those details of the activities that the candidates have carried out for their employer engagement. So the answer, in short, is yes, they do have to, to, uh, to do the planner every single year. Okay, John, um, da, 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 let's just have a look at another one. Are the optional units going to move on to using the marking grid to be marked? Uh, absolutely not. The optional units will remain um, past merit and distinction, and they will be marked against the criteria that are stated um, for the unit. So each unit has its own criteria that is at past merit of distinction and the optional units will simply be assessed against those criteria. Okay, next question. Can we give the sample standardisation material that's posted up here today out to students to view? Um, no. Uh, simply because it's last year's assignment so it will probably confuse them as to what's being asked for and it's marked against this year's paperwork so again um, you know, they don't need to see uh, practical observation forms and candidate record forms, etc. Um, I don't actually see how giving them this standardisation material would benefit the students in any way. I think it would also be quite confusing because this is actually a low standard of work, isn't it? This is just yes. sort of creeping through the past boundary. Yes, it? this isn't what and we so want them to aim for. I wouldn't want them to aim for that sort of standard, no. Excellent. Yeah, okay. So we've got another question here. When students are conducting the practicals, when assessing the student's ability to consolidate theory into practical, are we able to ask students questions during the practical, e.g. if they state there is no discharge, can we ask if there was, if there was what may be this, oh, sorry, if there was discharge, what would that be a sign of? Um, absolutely not. This is scaffolding. Uh, sorry, scaffolding your, your students. So um, basically what when we're saying for um, assessing their ability to consolidate theory to practical, rather than you asking the questions, what we expect is the student to be articulate themselves and, and say that to the assessor. So the student, without any prompting from the assessor, should be able to go... Um, there's no discharge, but if there was a discharge, it could be this colour and that could be a sign of this. Thank you. Next question, how did students add citations if they don't know the animals or tasks to be completed and using uh, not uh, being allowed to use the internet? Okay, um, this one confuses me a little bit because the students, when they're given the tasks and the assignment brief, then have a recommended time of four weeks to complete it, and that includes their research time. So the students can add citations if they want to from their research, and there's nothing to stop them doing that. Um, so the, the answer is that yes, they can research, and yes, they should know what animals they, they are going to be working on, because hopefully the learner will have chosen the animals. If the centre's choosing the animals for the students, then you need to be very careful that you're not either disadvantaging or advantaging one learner over another by the animal that you allocate them. Um, are level three students expected to reference? Is this part of marking criteria? Okay, so your, your assessment objectives are there telling you exactly what is the criteria. Um, Nowhere within that this year is there referencing mentioned. Um, so unlike last year where referencing was a separate assessment objective, this year there is no referencing in there whatsoever. Um, so in answer to that, no, they're not expected to reference. Okay. Are we able to mark the written work electronically as our learners are completing theirs on a USB stick? Absolutely. There's no reason why they cannot mark electronically. And just for those that aren't marking electronically and it's going to be handwritten, just bear in mind that if moderators cannot read the uh, what is written, 
then we cannot agree or disagree. Well, we can disagree with it, but we cannot agree with it. Next question, can we make our own practical prompt assessment sheets, then write up the City and Guild sheets after the assessment? Um, again, I'm not really sure what um, is meant by the practical prompt assessment sheets. Basically, um, the task is there of what they have to do. Um, so you then, as an assessor, just need to observe the candidate doing that task and any other practical task to then annotate the practical observation form. If you want to do a centre sheet to capture some evidence, so if you're doing different tasks or different people are doing different tasks, um, so you might have one assessor doing one task and one assessor doing another task, then you might want to put it down on your own piece of paper and then consolidate it onto the practical observation form. But as far as what we expect to be submitted, we expect one practical observation form to cover the whole of the synoptic assessment. Would it matter if there were two, John? Um, were two um, practical assessments? It, to be honest, it, it complicates things and confuses things. So, so it, it, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any model answers for this year's synoptic to help with marking synoptics? Uh, no, there are no model answers because we can't we can't give model answers. What we have given is, you know, you've got your unit content of what they should be taught. You've got how they're being assessed and what they're being assessed with. So you've got the criteria there as far as the assessment objectives are concerned. So then, as a centre, um, you are expected to have the expertise to be able to then break that down, clarify it, and give it a, a, a mark accordingly. There's one here, um, John. That I think. Again, you'll we'll both be able to answer really, but it's about plagiarism. Can you clarify, clarify plagiarism rules? As you said, large sections were copied and pasted. The rules on plagiarism are actually stated in the assessment pack, so candidates are, are pointed towards it in the candidate guidance. Um, there will also be lots of information on the website regarding plagiarism, but basically as a summary, it means that if a candidate is using the wording of others as their own, then they cannot be given any marks for that wording. So often we find in, um, in uh, assignments that suddenly a piece of text, like a paragraph or something, is suddenly quite differently written. And I think that's what John, you saw in, in the assignment, wasn't it? That you felt as though suddenly the, the wording looked very, very yes, different. Yes, absolutely. Perhaps more formal, use of punctuation was quite different. Um, no spelling errors, those sorts of things. And that can kind of highlight that perhaps that, um, that wording has just been copied directly. But um, copying something and then using that, that text for a specific um, explanation afterwards is fine because that candidate is then summarising the information that they've, that they've taken an excerpt from and, and showing their own knowledge and understanding following that. But simply copying and pasting and using that wording as somebody else's is, is wrong. Would you agree with that, John? Yeah, Absolutely, sure. yeah. Yep. Um, are, are synoptic grades only released on the exam results day or before? Um, the answer is neither. <laughs> the synoptic grades will be released in uh, June. The dates are on the website of when results days are. Um, obviously, the exam is slightly different because the, you have um, two uh, versions of the exam and two sittings for the exam. So the idea is that you would get your results from sitting exam one before exam two arises so that if there is anybody that fails, they can be sick. Yeah, so, so in terms of the, the whole qualification grade, so that's the synoptic the exam and, and the fact that they've jumped through the the other hoops that they've got to do, optional assignments and, and uh, employer engagement and all that sort of thing. Um, those results are actually issued, if it's a level three qualification, that's the first week in August. Um, it's level two and it's the second week in August, but that's, um, that's for the, the full qualification. The exam results days, as John said, will be um, specific to, uh, to probably four to six weeks following the exam. Can you clarify what happens when they fail optional tasks at both level two and level three? Okay, so for, 
for all the optionals, again, this is on the um, City and Guilds website, but basically the optionals are multiple attempts, so the candidate can re-attempt uh, optionals. Now, for level two, uh, there's only one um, optional per unit, so there's only one, one optional assessment per unit. Um, but for level three, there's a version A and a version B. So for level two, um, they would basically reset the elements that they failed um, to try and gain a pass. And for level three, if they sat version A and failed, they would then sit version B. Um, if they subsequently failed version B, they would then resit version A. And it, and it bounces back and forwards like that. So they can have as many attempts as they want, but they're not allowed to um, resit the same version consecutively, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm going to move away from optional units because really this webinar is, is um, specifically for the synoptic assignment. If you've got any other um, uh, questions regarding optional units, then, um, then post those through to the moderation support team who will be happy to help you. Um, I've got a question here. Did you, say, did you just say that they can be told four weeks before the start of the synoptic window? I'm thinking that question means that candidates can have the assignment brief four weeks before the synoptic window. And that answer to that is yes, they just don't see the tasks before they start that. Now, I would check because some assessment packs will say four weeks, some will say three or two or whatever, but you, it will be written into the assessment pack for your qualification how many weeks beforehand they're allowed to see that brief, which is the first bit that we looked at, and that is the story or the context that those candidates are given prior to be, being given the tasks. Next one down. What if a student submits a piece of work that they created at home as they know the assessment prior um, to the assessment date? Um, so again, the, it's stipulated that these are controlled assessments. So the candidate cannot create any part of the assessment at home in an uncontrolled situation. So they can research, but centres should be checking research materials when they come in to make sure that candidates simply, as part of their research, haven't done the task in their own time and are then just copying it across. So you should be looking at their research material to make sure that it is not just part of the assignment. Okay. Um, question here about spelling and grammar. Should course spelling or grammar have any effect on the assessment um, objectives grade awarded? Um, I would say really the only assessment objective would possibly be attention to detail or perfecting. But again, you know, if you look at the wording of the assessment objective, it doesn't actually particularly relate to spelling and grammar. So I don't think you can realistically lower a grade significantly because of spelling or grammar. It's not specifically in the test, then that's fine. Um, Ah, right, the synoptic up upload um, deadline date is the 18th of May. Does work experience need to be uploaded then too? And what is the date for the upload of optional units in June? Again, these are all on the um, City and Guilds website. But yes, the synoptic is the 18th of May, and then everything else is 15th uh, the 15th of June. There is actually a quite handy um, timeline that's uh, been posted up as a document in the technicals area of the website, so it's worth having a look at that. Um, we have... Are we allowed to tell learners from the week before week window which animals they will be working on in the practical task? Um, absolutely. Again, like I said before, if the centre is deciding that, then the centre needs to be very careful um, to make sure they're not disadvantaging or advantaging any learner over another. Um, but, you, you know, there's nothing to say that you cannot speak to the learners and find out which animals they would prefer to do and then see logistically if you can fit that in or not. OK, John, I'm going to stop you there because we're running out of time, actually. We have got a couple of questions on um, students that have additional needs. Um, and um, we will we will get back to you on the questions that we haven't been able to answer. But I would suggest that um, that those those um, centres looking at the candidates with additional needs 
would um, be pointed towards the access arrangements document. Um, and so just to, just to have a look at that first off, but we will get back to you with specific guidance on all of the answers to these questions. So thank you very much, everybody. We will record all of these. Um, so I'm just going to go into the next slide here, which is a, a little reminder of typical activities that you could carry out in your centre for internal standardisation. I say it's a reminder because the generic centre webinar that you may have listened to prior to this one did actually have this slide posted onto it as well. We went through it. So, John, if you want to just perhaps do some specific um, subject specific bits that uh, are relevant or just sort of have a quick summary of this. Yeah, so again, you know, for internal standardization, like I said before, the, the easiest way for a centre to standardise is to appoint uh, pretty much like a lead marker. That person would mark the assignment and then brings everyone else in to tolerance of them. Uh, bearing in mind that the City and Guild's tolerance is um, plus or minus three marks. Um, so, you know, get start discussing and practising that holistic marking as a team. Decide what you're looking for within the assignment, what you expect learners to produce. Um, and then when learners do produce it and you start marking, the, the initial marking activity should be um, basically breaking it down against the assessment objectives to then bring everyone else in line with that. Okay, but um, you know, the, the information's there um, and obviously hopefully today um, shows you how um, I pull the information from the assignment to justify the assessment objectives. Thanks, John. Okay, finally, we're coming on to the slide that, uh, that gives you a few links here. We've got the link to the City and Guild's website tech back pages. You'll find lots of documents on there that will support you in your delivery and um, assessment of the, the technical. Um, we've also got the technicals and moderation support team. We've got here their um, email address and also their telephone number. And then finally, we've got a link here to the qualification report, which we referred to earlier. Um, and it's a really good idea to have a look at this um, qualification report coming out of last year's um, uh, assessments. Not only does it cover both of the, the um, series of exams, the external exams, but it also covers areas of the synoptic assignment that were or weren't responded to in, um, very well. So it can... Um, it can help you to avoid the pitfalls that some centres may have fallen into, and it will also show some areas of good practice as well. Um, so I'm sure you'll find that document really helpful. It also gives you data as to how many people got passes, merits and distinctions, so that's quite interesting to look at too. So I'm going to say thank you very much to John, and thank you very much for your attention today. And, um, and hopefully we'll get back to you within a couple of days with the answers to the rest of your questions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.